Y'all got it? Got it. Okay. All right, so 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're going to start with the fourth verse to the sixth verse. And I'm going to be reading the NLT version. For we speak as messengers approved by God to be entrusted with the good news. Our purpose is to please God, not people. Our purpose is to please God, not people. He alone examines the motives of our hearts. Never once did we try to win you with flattery, as you well know, and God is our witness that we were not pretending to be your friends. <laughs> Just to get your money. <laughs> as for human praise, we have never sought it from you or anyone else. Tonight, I want to look at that small section that says, our purpose is to please God, not people. So tonight, um, I'm going to be preaching from the topic of thief of joy. Everybody say thief of joy. All right. Well, if this is your first time here, welcome. <laughs> Good to see you. Your beard's immaculate. I love it. I'm jealous about it. It's okay, man. You got a good beard. Y'all look good. How many of y'all feel good? You feel good? You feel all right? Amen. Bless the Lord. <laughs> Anybody? Um, I, I'm nervous to ask this. Have you already started, like, your pumpkin spice chai latte? Yeah, I knew there was one. Is it anybody else? All right, we got two in the building. Anybody else got your pup three? All right, welcome. All the basics. We're so happy to have y'all here. Um, how many of y'all have started playing Christmas music? Good. I'd have to pray over you. Almost there? That's sick. We don't have to pray over you after this. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, my name is Pastor Lincoln. I am the worship pastor as well as the young adult pastor here in um, for those who don't know me, I'm not your grandmother's worship pastor. I am. I got on blazers. I got kinks in my hair. I'm very different. Um, but I'm excited because that's who God made me to be. Because the Bible tells me that he made me to please him, not everybody else. So therefore, tonight, I want to talk about it from the, the lens of thief of joy. Um, thieves come to... To, they steal while you're distracted and not paying attention, right? One of my favorite thief movies, don't, don't get wild, uh, not the Italian job, it is good, but Ocean's Eleven. Anybody ever seen Ocean's Eleven? Boy, that's my movie. I'm trying to tell you. I can go home and watch George, uh, George Clooney and Brad Pitt, and it's like three of them, like Ocean's Eleven, 12, 13. I thought they was going to make it 14, but I'm glad they didn't. Um, oh, they did make it 14. It's the Oceans with all the ladies in it, and it was still good. The premise is like they stealing and they good at it. Why are they good at it? Because they didn't get caught. They were never seen stealing until it was too late. They robbed a man blind in his own building <laughs> while they was in a safe. They robbed a safe in a casino. They robbed him while he wasn't aware of what was going on. And what I find, found out in this this walk of life is there are things that are stealing our joy and we don't even realize it. They are thieves of our joy. And I want to talk about three of them. Um, these three thieves are the wealthiest thieves of all time. The wealthiest thieves of all time. The first thief of joy, write this down. A thief of joy is comparison. Comparison is wealthy. We compare ourselves to every single thing and every single person. Comparison is one of the most wealthiest thieves in the world. It's so wealthy and so good at its thievery that we can lose our joy by one scroll in the middle of the night, by one like in the middle of the night. Our joy can be snatched from us because we're trying to compare our current joy to somebody else's fake joy. <laughs> somebody else's Bermuda trip, 
somebody else's Cancun island, whatever it is for you, somebody else's car, a truck, somebody else's marriage, somebody else's kids, somebody else's uh, job. We compare and contrast every single thing and we don't realize how robbed we are until it's too late. Comparison is a thief of joy. We cannot even see what God has created in us because our eyes are fixed on what he hasn't given us. God, how come you ain't? God, why? How come so-and-so? Comparison. We worried about everybody else's walk except for ours. And because of that, we are distracted by what God has actually blessed us with versus what he has not given to us yet. It's not about that we don't have something. It's about that we may not be prepared to receive it yet. This is one of the biggest lessons I ever learned in my life. I used to complain a lot. Lord, how come so-and-so got this and blah, blah, blah. And then the next thing I know, I was just like, the Lord was like, you're not even ready to receive that. Why are you praying for it? I don't have the capacity to receive what that person has. I don't have the capacity to receive happiness, let alone a blessing. You can't. Stop praying for stuff if you can't afford it. <laughs> right? <laughs> Physically and spiritually. If you cannot afford forgiveness because you don't give it out, stop praying for it. If you can't afford self, self-love, you're trying to tell, yeah, stop praying for it. You don't even tell yourself you love you. How can somebody else love you? Stop praying for it. We are bankrupting ourselves of substance and of, of, in, of spiritual income because we don't realize the problem is not with God or the giver. The problem is with the receiver. I'm not able to receive because I have so much stuff in front of me that I don't want to give up. Because if I lose those things, if I lose my insecurity, if I lose my fear of this, that, and the third, I will lose my comfort zone. And then God can get to me and he'll see the ugly of me. He'll see the lost part of me. So I'd rather keep and hoard those things instead of give them to him because I hold them so close, which means they keep me warm. They keep me cozy. They keep me comfortable, which I don't even realize that I'm robbing myself of what God has because I'm holding on to what I have so closely too much. My fear of losing that person, my fear of losing this thing, my fear... Holding on to fear is not good. Do we realize that? Holding on to fear is not good. We think it's keeping us safe. It's not. It's keeping you away from what God has for you. But one of the thieves we're talking about, comparison, is the one thing that keeps you from seeing what God has already put on the inside of us. Comparison is the very thing that I struggle with the most. As a pastor, um, as a musician, I compare everything. I'm comparing this whole month till the album come out. Ain't that disgusting? I'm just being honest. We have a whole project out. Our first 10, 10 song album. And I'm extremely proud of it. It's the third album that we have done since we've done music. And I'm comparing it. It ain't even out yet, Spencer. <laughs> it ain't even out yet. You want to know why I'm comparing it? Because my eyes have been filled with what I see is already better than it. <laughs> Well, it don't sound like this person. It don't look, oh, we could have did this, we could have that. Now, parts of that is just the creative process. You always want to revise things. It's just being a creative. Y'all know what I'm talking about. But the down part of it is that you don't get to enjoy the ride of what is happening right now. I have a hard time enjoying the ride of what is happening in front of my face. We about to have a full album out that got videos with it this time and got all this different stuff. And it's got, I'm like, oh my goodness, I should be enjoying it. And I'm hating it because I'm thinking about the next project. I'm thinking about the next thing. I'm thinking about why didn't we fix this? Why didn't we do this here and this, that, and third? And guess what? I'm the only one that's doing it. (laughs) (laughs) See? That's the other producer on the album. That's my MD, the person I trust the most. And this person told me that it sounds good. Guess what I said? What I said? Exactly. Because I held it in. (laughs) I was like, yeah. We on to the next. We on to the next. That's what I say. And, it's, and there's a part of me that has to be worked on consistently through everything that I'm, I'm way better than what I used to be, but I'm not 
dumb enough to not admit where I'm at, where I am right now. Does that make sense? I'm humble enough to be like, I do know that I need to still work on this. So what do I do? I'm not on social media a lot right now because I follow those people who do more than us, but they also got more money and resources than us. We're doing what God has asked us to do. Use what you have that's in your hands so we can make it better each time that we take a step, right? But we get so lost in the sauce of comparison that our joy is taken from us, from enjoying something that should be enjoyed. We cannot enjoy things because comparison is a thief of joy. Write this down. Comparison is a symptom of insecurity. (laughs) Comparison is a symptom of insecurity. When I am insecure, I compare to everything. Guess what? So did Moses. Yes, he did. Moses, this is what made me mad about Moses, but I get it. Moses was face to face with God, the burning bush, all this cool stuff. Now, if some of y'all go outside and talk to a burning bush right now, that's not the Lord. You, it's just, it's not him. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go home and and talk to your campfire either. It's not him. But what I I loved about Moses in this moment is that he was honest with God. We don't want to be honest with him. Moses said, who am I to go free a nation? Not a couple of them, a nation, the chosen nation. Moses was insecure. And he was worried why God chose him. What was he doing? He was comparing himself to people that came before him. Came before him. And it's a dangerous place to live. Insecurity. Insecurity is a dangerous place to live. Write this down. Another thief of joy is insecurity. Insecurity can rob you of your joy so quickly. You're comparing yourself to everybody because you're insecure about yourself. You're insecure about your abilities. We're insecure about our giftings. We're insecure about our our ability to be a wife, to be a husband, to be a parent, to be a daughter, to be a son, to be a professional, to be all these things. We are insecure about them because we truly do not have faith in our ability of who we are of who God made us to be. Watch this. Insecurity has to be fed. You have to feed your insecurity. And it's easy to do. (laughs) Being insecure is so dangerous because we don't realize how much we are feeding our insecurity. So case in point, I was talking about we have a project coming out. I know I'm insecure about it in certain sections, not because it's bad, just because it's me. And what I do is while I'm scrolling, I get my, I'm feeding myself on my feed. I'm feeding myself on my feed. And what I'm feeding is my insecurity, which is so crazy to think about. I'm feeding my insecurity. You have to learn how to stop scrolling. You have to, and not just scrolling on the internet, forget Instagram. You got to learn how to stop scrolling in your mind. Stop talking to yourself so darkly. So darkly. I'm telling y'all this from experience. And I'm just going to keep it hot today. (laughs) Like, I have to tell myself what God allowed to happen in my life happened for a reason. Every good thing and every bad thing. Not just the good stuff. Everything that God allowed to happen in my life happened for a reason. It either came to show me something or to mold me into something. It came to show me something or it came to mold me into something. It came to mold me into a better husband. It came to mold me into a better friend. It came to mold me into a better pastor. It came to mold me into something. But it also came to show me something. What am I doing wrong right now? 
what am I doing that needs to be fixed? What am I doing that, and here's the thing, you can't fix it, only God can. Because then we try to turn into Bob the Builder. <laughs> we want to fix everything. We want to fix our situation. And here's the other part <clears throat> that I'm noticing about God. He, he will do certain, he will allow certain things to the point where you can't fix it because he wants you to realize that it can't be fixed without him. It can't be fixed without him. We do so much without him that he wants us to realize that we need to do it with him. But our insecurities will tell us, well, God won't help me here. <laughs> God won't. Uh, it's a dangerous place to live in inside of your insecurities. When you feed your insecurities, you get full of insecurities. You're full. Remember what I used to preach about? Whatever you are full of will come out. Yeah. If you're full of insecurity, that's what will come out when pressure time comes. When it's time for you to get squeezed, insecurity will come out. When it's time for life to, to throw its battle at you, whatever is in, on the inside will come out. Hear me when I say this. That's why in dark times, in tough times, you need to fill yourself up with the word of God. This is what should come out when times get tough. I'm being so real right now. If, if <clears throat> Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness and the tempter did not come until he was hungry. The tempter only comes when we're hungry. <laughs> he ain't coming when you fool, when you're in the middle of church, when you sing your favorite worship song. That's not when the devil comes. The devil comes when you're in your house having a thought. <laughs> The devil comes when you're in your job or in your car, you having a thought. That's when the enemy comes. He comes when struggle is at its best point in time. He coming when that pressure is on your neck. He's coming when that, that uncomfortable feeling is on you. He's not gonna come when you're strong, he's gonna come when you're weak, when you're questioning God. One of the biggest things I ever learned about the devil is that he will, the, the main thing he wants you to do is to get you to doubt the character of God. God really don't love you. God really don't care about you. God doesn't see your situation. He's too busy over here. That's what the enemy wants us to think. But the devil is a lie. Yeah. So therefore, we have to realize that am I getting caught up in an emotion, in a trap because I'm insecure right now? Is this really me or am I getting caught up in a trap that's leading me down a rabbit hole that the enemy is using? The enemy cannot create anything. He can only utilize. Right. Remember that. Satan can't create anything at all. <laughs> but he can utilize life. <laughs> he's good at utilizing. He's top tier. Want to know why? Because he's a deceiver. He's a thief. And thieves utilize situations to get what they want. They, in Ocean's Eleven, they utilize the, the anger and the, um, the impulsiveness of the guy that they were robbing to, re, to make him not even realize that he was getting robbed. Remember that? They were making him mad. They were talking him up. They were doing all this. It was frustrating him. They utilized what was already there. They didn't turn him into an angry person. They utilized his weakness. And therefore, they were able to rob him blind. Stop letting insecurity rob you blind. God has not called you for such a time as this for you to be insecure about it. God has called you for a time such as this for you to find confidence in him because he chose you, because he called you. One thing I love about God is he calls who he wants. He'll call a drunk and turn him all the way around. He'll call a crackhead and turn them all the way around. We don't get to determine and judge who God calls. I love that he does that. I love that God calls anybody because he can. And if he can call them and carry them, then what will he do for me? What will he do for me? But if I'm being robbed in my mind, I won't be able to see it because all I will see and experience is my insecurities. I'm insecure about being a dad. I'm insecure about being a mom. I'm insecure about being a son. I'm insecure about, I'm insecure about being a professional. I'm insecure about this. The more that we lean into our insecurities, we will lean further away from the truth that God has called us. We have to lean into the fact that God chose us even when we did not choose ourselves. 
when we did not say yes to ourselves, when we did not care for ourselves. And there are so many giving people in this room and in this world, especially people who are just really, really giving of themselves. Don't forget to give back to yourself. Yeah. Let me teach you a trick, okay? Uh, well, not a trick, good point. I'm gonna teach you a lesson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tricks is for kids. Um, I wanna teach y'all something. <laughs> One of the things that, so some of y'all don't know this about me, but like I went to, my master's is in psychology and um, science of education. So psychology, all that stuff. One of the things that they teach counselors to do and that, that they teach counselors to tell their clients is you need to invest in something called self-care. <laughs> self-care. Everybody say self. self. Care. care. Say it one more time, self. self. Care. Meaning you got to care about yourself. <laughs> and guess what? Y'all not good at it. Because I'm not good at it. I'm getting better. Oh, I'm getting better. <laughs> My phone go on silent at a certain time. Don't call me. You'll get a text the next morning. <laughs> Self-care. Eight o'clock? Mm-mm. <laughs> Seven? Okay. <laughs> Seven fifty-nine. You better watch out. <laughs> You're going to get that little moon at the bottom of the text message. I swear. Oh, and I don't feel bad about it. Let me, tell you, let me tell you this. This is so important. It's so important. Listen, listen, listen. I don't care about it because it's my self-care. I know who I turn to at night. Do y'all hear me? I know where my thoughts go to at night. So what I do to counter those thoughts and to counter those beliefs, and my wife hates it, I watch TV. <laughs> I will put on Netflix and Netflix myself to sleep. <laughs> Ain't that sick? <laughs> <laughs> but let me tell you why, Spencer. Let me tell you why. Because it's self-care. My mind needs to shut up at night. And for years, for years, I could not get my mind to shut up. I would go to sleep like a normal person and I would be awake yeah. because my mind was running. <laughs> my mind is just everywhere because I'm so full of my insecurities that I cannot even go to sleep and be at peace for who God has called me to be. So I had to do something to counteract that. So now I, I Netflix myself to sleep. I pee, peacock of the office. Now that's my show. I watch it anytime. <laughs> but like I watch it and now it's just become a self-care custom of mine. It's not me staying up because I'm insecure having a thought. It's me like this is my routine. And then I go upstairs and I be asleep. She wake up. I'm there. <laughs> right? Now my wife can go to sleep at a moment's notice. <laughs> She's a beautiful sleeper. Just out. <laughs> I don't know if it's a, like a date, like I don't know if that's a good thing, but like she can go to sleep right out. <laughs> it's crazy, I envy her. Me, it takes me a minute because my mind runs. Her mind runs in the morning when she's getting up, when she's taking care of our son, when she's feeding him, when she's preparing his lunch for the day. Her mind runs in the morning, so she processes a lot in the morning. So what we do is before we leave the house, we pray. We say, God, let us have a beautiful day. Thank you for this day. Thank you for our finances. Thank you for this family. Thank you for this home. Bless us to the, through the day. Now, when I'm in a season like I'm in right now, what I've done is I'm skipping ahead to my point. Let me, let me slow down. There are certain things that we have to do in order to guard our joy, okay? So, Excuse me, I have to self-care. Everybody say self-care. Care. Care. Okay, because my insecurities are the things that are, that are keeping me up. My insecurities are the things that are causing me to be jumbled. So therefore, I got to figure out how to turn and shut these insecurities up. So I have to self-care. Okay. How can I have joy if I fill myself with the opposite of joy? <laughs> how can I experience the goodness of God <laughs> this is so, yeah. God did not send us to this struggle that's before us 
without being equipped. Do y'all hear me? God did not send you to whatever you are going through unequipped. Okay? Listen to me when I say this. Look at verse 4. For we speak as messengers approved by God. Approved by God. For we speak as messengers approved by God to be entrusted with the good news. Our purpose is to please God, not people. He alone examines the motives of our heart. Write this down. We can have joy because we are approved. Ain't nothing better than being approved for a credit limit on your credit card. Being approved for a house, being approved for a loan, being approved for a car. There is something about being approved that brings a level of confidence in us. We are approved by God. Moses was approved by God through a burning bush. He said, when you go down there, tell them who sent you. (laughs) I'm paraphrasing. Joseph was approved when God called him. Even though his brothers jacked him up, even though he was thrown in prison, he was still himself in prison. Uh, David was approved and he was the last one to be chosen (laughs) out of all the brothers. You were approved by God to fight this battle that you fight. You were approved. You were approved. You have been equipped. You have been prepared. Therefore, stop letting your joy be taken for free. (laughs) Stop letting your joy be taken for free. F-R-E-E, that spells free. (laughs) Some of y'all don't even give the enemy a fight. (laughs) Some of us don't even put up a fight. We just let it happen. We let the enemy steal our joy. We let the enemy steal our confidence. We let him steal everything. We won't put up a fight. And what do I mean? We don't pray. We won't put up our hands. Well, I don't want to say that. We pray, but we don't pray without ceasing. Y'all know what that means? It's not stopping. It's an, praying without ceasing, what I found out is that when you understand what praying without ceasing means, you will understand that it is a practice. <laughs> praying without ceasing is not just words on a page. It is a practice, meaning once I pray the first time, that's not the only time I pray about that thing. I pray until I see something happens push, whatever. I'm saying pray until the thing actually happens. Even when it's close to it, until it's done, keep praying for it. Because there's seasons where we pray for something and it feels like things are getting lighter and we back up off of our aggression of the prayer. Uh Uh-uh. Keep praying just as aggressive as it's as far away and when it's up close. Y'all hear what I'm saying? If you're praying about something, I don't know what y'all praying about, but whatever you're praying about, pray uh, pray about it with... (laughs) viciousness. I don't know any other way to pray. Pray with some attitude sometimes. I, I, I don't know any other way to explain this. I sent a message out to our prayer. Um, no, I sent a message out to our worship team. Our worship team is 50 people, maybe more. I haven't recounted since we added some new people. There's a lot of people. And what did I send them? I'm glad you asked. I told them, hey, I want y'all to start Praying in your heavenly language over your house and over your mind. Starting this week. Am I lying? Antoine? Zach? Okay. Why did I send them that? Because often, even as the worship team, we forget how to pray. (laughs) There are some things that have to be prayed. There are some things that have to be prayed against with viciousness. Let me give you all an example. When baby boy got sick um, and he was struggling, it wasn't a cute prayer I was walking around my house saying, (laughs) okay? I was walking around doing, now this is not churchy. This is a practice that we need to do more. I'm trying to give you a superpower that you can take with you. Y'all need to start praying like, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke everything in this house that is not of you. 
And if it ain't you, it has to leave because this is a house that serves you and loves you and welcomes you. If there is any attack on the enemy that is snuck inside this house, we rebuke it in the name of Jesus. That's how y'all got to start praying. You want your mind to be clear from all this insecurity, from all of this frustration. Start praying like you want it to be cleared of all this frustration. I told everybody a long time ago, I'm not making no more weak Christians. No more. Because the stuff that we are facing is not letting up. (laughs) Do y'all hear me? Like the stuff that we're facing against ain't letting up. It ain't getting cute. It ain't being merciful. So why should I be merciful to it? Why should I be cute with it? Everything that's going on in my mind is keeping me up at night. Why should I not put up a fight against it? If it's man enough and spirit enough to come against me, I got something for it. It's called the Holy Spirit that rests on the inside. It's not just a cute thing. It's a powerful thing. In Acts, they talked about the power of the Holy Spirit fell upon them. Philip marched down to Samaria and had the Holy Spirit with him to cast out witches and demons. Okay? This is not spooky stuff. Okay? This is real stuff. Because some of the stuff you're dealing with ain't even in this realm. It's in the spiritual realm. It's demonic. Okay? We need to learn how to fight properly. Do y'all hear me? We need to learn how to fight properly. Why? Because there is so much more on the other side of that fight. (laughs) There's so much more on the other side of it. Imagine if you quit right now, not even realizing that you almost done fighting. I would hate to stop fighting and stop calling and stop pushing for my family, for my son, for my wife, for my mom, for my dad. I would hate to stop fighting for those, for my peace, for my joy, for my understanding. I would hate to stop fighting early, not realizing I'm almost done. Mm -hmm. I don't want to stop fighting too early. I don't want to give in too early because it's the moment that I give in, my insecurities go for a knockout punch. In fights and boxing, the other box is always looking for the right time, the right window, the right opportunity to get their best shot in. (laughs) The enemy is not waiting till you are fully guarded up. He's waiting for that little window for you to be weak enough to drop your guard. And that's when that right hook is coming for you. Y'all hear me? This is why we have to realize that there is an enemy, there is a devil, there is a demon, there is whatever you want to call it. A bad vibe is coming. (laughs) And its job is to steal, kill, and destroy. So anything that's here to steal, kill, and destroy me, I'm not going to give them my joy for free. You're going to have to pry it from my alive hands. I'm going to say my dead hands, my cold dead hands. I don't know where I got that from. Too many movies. <laughs> but you're going to have to pry it from me. I'm not going to give it to you for free. I know people who are bound that fight better than us right now. <laughs> Slaves fought better than some of us. Hebrew and black. I'm saying that we need to learn how to protect ourselves better. Write this down. Whatever you do not protect can be stolen. (laughs) Whatever you do not protect can be stolen. If you do not protect your peace, it can be stolen. If you do not protect your joy, it can be stolen. If you do not... (sighs) I wish I would have knew some of this stuff at a younger time in my teenage years. I wish I would have known that if I don't protect something, it can be stolen. I had so many people steal away from me and I did not realize it. And now I'm in my 30s trying to catch up to stuff that is gone now. Y'all hear what I'm saying? I'm trying to catch up to some things that were stolen from me. Now, God is a restorer. He's a redeemer. But I wish I would have protected it better so it didn't have to get stolen. Y'all hear me? Whatever you do not protect can be stolen. The enemy wants you to doubt the character of God. 
He wants you to doubt how good God is. It's easy to sing about the goodness of God. It's hard to believe it when it don't feel good right now. <laughs> All my life you have been faithful, except for right now. <laughs> All my life you have been so, so good, except for right now. <sighs> most days that I am able, or most days when I feel like it, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after. Well, your goodness used to run after, run after me. With my life laid down, maybe not anymore though. I wish I could surrender now so I could give you everything. <laughs> yeah, the lyrics feel different when you're changing up to your actual real circumstance. Mm-hmm. It's your breath in our lungs, and I'm going to use it to be angry with you right now. <laughs> I'm not going to pour out my praise. I'm going to pour out my frustration. Because you can handle it, Lord. Ah, I know. Y'all was not prepared tonight. That's okay. Welcome. Yeah. Our circumstances have different lyrics. <laughs> our circumstances have different lyrics. Our joy sings the original composition of the song. Our frustration creates a remix. <laughs> I'm telling y'all, hear from a worship pastor. I can remix a song based off my circumstance. It only, it only becomes real worship when I sing the song in spite of what I'm going through. That's what real worship is. When I can sing that you are faithful, when I don't feel your faithfulness right now, that's when it's worship. Mm -hmm. I wish we had more worship leaders that sang with sacrifice in their heart. I'm thankful that this is a church where it can be sang that way, but we have other churches who do not sing that way, that do not minister that way. And it is so important that we remember that God is good in spite of what is happening around me. Because everything else is stealing my joy. <laughs> everything else. That's why I got to pray with viciousness. I'm praying to fight off these things from making me not forget how good God has been to me. I'm trying to hold everything. Uh -uh. I remember when God healed my mother of cancer. I remember when God healed me. Uh -uh. I will fight the devil at a moment's notice because this is how good God has been to me. I'm not moving farther away from him in the middle of circumstances. I'm moving closer. I'm grasping every good thing that he has done for me. And I may look stupid, but this is how much I'm trying to fight and keep the devil away from every good thing that God has done for me. Am I making sense in here? This is what we got to do to keep the thief away from us. I got to fight tooth and nail. There is... There is an attack on families, on men, on women, on everything. A trouble on every side. But it is not something that the Bible did not see. There's attacks against so many things. And what I'm finding out is that the more attacks there are, the less, <laughs> the less we fight because we get exhausted by everything that's going on in the world. Oh, this is coming up. Man, I just pray, oh, another person got shot. Another black man got shot. Another this, another that. And we start to be exhausted by how life is going instead of yeah. getting up and like, you know what? Maybe we need to pray a little bit more. Maybe we need to stay before the face of God a little bit more. Maybe we need to actually be what the Bible calls Christ-like and stop being these bad representations of Jesus. It's not about how bad the world is or how dark the world is. It's about how much light am I about to give off? Yeah, right. <laughs> how much light am I about to give off right now in this moment? Because what I am finding out, the more that I live more life, the more that I experience more turmoil, experience more pain, experience more insecure thoughts, 
what I'm finding out is that the more that I protect myself and cover myself with the word of God, the farther and farther those feelings and those thoughts get away from me. I said this one time. I said the valley, when you're in the valley, the valley is not a place for you to complain. <laughs> it's a place for you to listen. The valley of my situation, the deep part of my situation, it's not there for me to complain because I have to be careful what I say in a valley. When you speak in a valley, it echoes. <laughs> You got to be careful what you say in a valley because it'll echo. So I can't talk that much. I have to listen. What is God saying to you now? Not what he said two years ago, not what he said two months ago, not what he said when you was on the mountaintop. No, no, no. Mountaintop don't count for valley. What is he saying now? What's he saying now? Because what he's saying now I'm a firm believer, and I may be wrong, because a lot of people preach about the mountaintop. I love the valley. <laughs> you want to know why? Because I'm going to get out. The end goal is not for me to stay there and die. The goal is for me to be there and listen. Once I learn my lesson and hear what thus saith the Lord, the outcome is climb again. <laughs> We want to live our life on the mountaintop. That's why our joy gets stolen so quickly. Because as soon as the right gust of wind <laughs> breathes across, it knocks off our equilibrium. It knocks off um, our, our stableness. It's our stableness. It, it makes us unwavering. It makes us unsettled. And then we start to say, well, am I going to fall off? Of, am I gonna, it's not safe up here. No, 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 no. The more... <laughs> The more you build yourself in the valley, the better you will survive the mountaintop. Do y'all hear me? At the top of the roller coaster is the scariest. <laughs> but it's the highest vantage point. It's where you can see everything. Life is a roller coaster. It's gonna be a lot of mountaintop times. It's gonna be a lot of times where you're right at the top and you get that gasp of air of like, oh, I can finally breathe. And then life happens, and you gotta go back down. Here's the challenge. The next time you go back down, make sure that you go back down. <laughs> you up, this is great. But the next time you go back down, make sure you go back down. Go back down often. <laughs> Not just when things are terrible. Go back down on the mountaintop. Your posture has to match the moment. Your posture has to match the situation. I'm not telling y'all that times aren't tough. I'm not telling y'all to not be humans, to not cry, to not be troubled over something. But don't live there. Don't turn a season into a lifestyle. If you're depressed now, you won't always be depressed. If you're stuck now, you won't always be stuck. If you're angry now, you won't always be. I feel God so much. If you're angry right now, you won't always be angry. But you got to tell yourself that. <laughs> I'm not going to be here forever. I'm going to learn what I need to learn. But by God, I'm getting out of here. My God, my God, if I stop and realize the goodness of God and how consistent he has been in my life, how he has pulled me out of every single dirty, miry pit, I can remember that while I'm on my knees. I can remember just how consistent he has been. It's about posture. The thief wants to steal your posture. <laughs> he wants to tell you, get off your knees. It ain't working. <laughs> I know how the devil works. He wants to tell you, stop praying. He can't hear you. Stop going to church. He don't see you. That's what the enemy wants to do. He's a thief. 
-hmm. We have to stop giving thieves our possessions for free. I'm fighting every single time I own, own. What, what we say in the street? On sight. <laughs> on sight. On sight when the enemy comes against my wife. On sight, I'm at you. When the enemy comes against my son, I'm at you. On sight. When the enemy comes against me, on sight, I'm at you. I'm going to get a t-shirt and say on sight. <laughs> in the name of Jesus at the bottom. <laughs> But that's how y'all got to treat the devil, man. That's how you got to treat this demonic stuff. And I don't care. I'm using the word demonic for a specific reason, because half the stuff going on in the world is demonic. <laughs> but you know a God who handles and dismisses all demonic things. That's the thing to remember. I serve a God who sits high, looks low, but I also don't serve a high priest that cannot feel what I have felt. Jesus literally felt everything that we feel. Jesus in the garden, depressed and worried. <laughs> I love Jesus. He was for real. He was like, uh, <laughs> hey, <laughs> I know why you sent me here. Don't tell me. <laughs> but... <laughs> Because he was human. God, <laughs> Jesus knows what that but feels like. God, I know you called me to this but. God, I know you told me I was going to be the one to break the generational curse in my family. But. That but is to say that today I don't kind of feel it, though. I don't feel like that. <laughs> I don't feel like that prodigal child is coming home. I don't feel like my significant other is out there. I don't feel like that job is going to choose me. I just don't feel it. It's a dangerous space to live in your feelings. Imagine if God lived, imagine if Jesus lived by his feelings. In that moment, he felt great distress to the point where his sweat was dripping like blood. It was as thick as blood. Imagine if he lived out his feelings, we would not have a savior to call. If Jesus lived by his feelings, we would not have a savior that died on the cross, that rose from the grave to heal us and to save us and to bring us into a space. Imagine if he did live by his feelings and not by his divinity. Jesus says, one but and ends with another but. <laughs> he says, if you could take, but if you could take this cup from me, and he rambles and he says, but your will be done. You may start with one but, but make sure you end with a different one. <laughs> Lord, I know I'm supposed to break this generational curse, but I just don't feel it. But if you said it, I believe it. That's how you got to start talking to yourself. I will not give the thief my possessions for free. He will have to fight for them. He will have to almost kill me for them. <laughs> That's how much I have to guard them. So tonight, I just want to remind you that you got to fight for what you want. Everything. I'm not talking with your hands. Well, with your hands, with your knees. But you got to fight in the spirit. Go back and pray again. And after you pray then, pray again. And after you pray that time, pray some more. Pray without ceasing. Remember what I say, even when it feels like it's on the way, pray again. Because that's the moment where it feels like it's close, but then it'll get so soon as you let up. It's when the enemy looks, or oh, they tired, got him. Or oh, they think it's over, got him. That's when the enemy wants to kill us. We have to fight better. Thieves of joy. That was really just an intro to tell y'all that we need to fight better. Stop comparing yourself to everybody else's walk. It's not your walk. Stop comparing yourself to how other people parent. That ain't how you parent. Stop trying to be the, I don't know, 
this unrealistic person that you're trying to be. That's why you can't sleep. That's why you can't eat. That's why you can't do all these things. You're trying to be this unrealistic persona that you can't even keep up with. The worst thing to live by is unrealistic expectations. Worst thing ever. Um, something that I had to learn um, as a worship pastor, as a pastor, period, really. There are unrealistic expectations people put on pastors. I'm still a human. I still get angry. I still get sad. <laughs> we expect pastors to be God. And that's not who they built to be. You hear me? We expect pastors. Now, I'm not saying that pastors should not have a level of Y'all know what I'm saying. But I'm saying, remember that they are you. They just happen to be chosen to do something different than you. Remember, Jesus chose Paul. I mean, God chose Paul. Paul was killing Jews. And now Paul has some of the most prolific letters we have ever read in our lives. There's a letter that God is writing with your life. Hear me. Hold on, Antoine. There, there is a letter that God is writing with your life. But if you do not allow him to write it, somebody else will not benefit. Listen to me. We have Galatians, we have the Corinthians, we have Romans, we have all of these letters that were written by Paul, and we are benefiting from them from their wisdom. Your life, your letter that God is writing, somebody else is going to benefit off of it. You have to keep letting them write it, which means you have to keep struggling. You have to keep praying. You have to keep crying. You have to keep calling out to him. Y'all think Paul wasn't calling out to him in prison, writing all these letters to people he'll never see? There are some people that you'll never meet that are going to be connected, saying, man. <laughs> There's some people I'm never going to meet that'll hear this sermon or another song. There's going to be people that, it amazes me how I many people listen to our music from other countries. And I just be like, who are these people? <laughs> and you know what it is? They're saying, thank God for somebody in Poland, Ohio, that wrote this song just for me. Now that is what keeps me from losing my mind and being insecure. The fact that there is somebody in another country saying, thank God that somebody wrote this just for me. I don't know where they are from. I don't know what they look like. People may not ever know what I look like, but they will know that the story of my life, the sacrifice, of my obedience will be heard and I may never not meet them. But the only way I can get that letter written is if I struggle, <laughs> is if I learn how to persevere, if I push through what is causing me so much stress, it's keeping me up at night, it's making me sick, it's making me second think my abilities, but my God, I'm going to push through it because there's a story on the other side of it. There's a story on the other side of it. Everybody's head bowed and eyes closed in this place. Father, we thank you for the afflictions that you have allowed to happen. <laughs> God, we're praying a weird prayer tonight. Thank you for the things that you have allowed. Thank you for the struggles that you have allowed because it shows us that you trust us to be able to walk through it. Your word says that you won't put anything on us that we cannot bear. So if it's on us, that means we got good enough shoulders to handle it. And even in our moments of weakness where we feel weak, remind us that we are strong because of you and through you. Father, let us never give our joy to the enemy for free. Never again. Let us fight with our prayer. Let us fight with our worship. Let us fight with our prayers without ceasing. God, let us see that you are the God of all the earth. 
You are the God that can heal and restore and redeem. You are the God that can sin so many things to help us, to protect us. You can send peace, you can send joy, you can send laughter, you can send so many things to stop the dark things creeping into our minds. So God, tonight, we put our flag in the ground and say, I will not give my joy to the thief anymore. My joy is not for free. It cannot be manipulated, it cannot be stolen. I want to live a life where my joy cannot be compromised by my situation. In Jesus' name. Somebody said amen? And amen. You got to... One thing I learned from Pastor Dave Allman is that the word is better received when it's real. <laughs> it's better received when it's real. I'm not going to come up here and give y'all three points in a poem. <laughs> Look at this. Let me give y'all a bonus. Isaiah 48 and 10, I have refined you, but not as silver is refined. Rather, I have refined you in the furnace of suffering. <laughs> I will rescue you, though, <laughs> for my sake. Yes, for my own sake. I will not let my reputation be tarnished. And I will not share my glory with idols. Isaiah 48, verse 10 to 11. You're going to suffer, but I'm going to rescue you. I will not let, ooh, I will not let my reputation be tarnished. What have I been saying to y'all? The enemy wants you to second guess God's character. And he says right here, oh, I'm not going to let my reputation be tarnished. I will rescue you, but you do got to suffer just for right now. Everybody say, just for right now. Just for right now. Just for right now. Just for right now.